think that you'll have a default screen that'll indicate whether or not to go right with the according, recording. Okay, go ahead, Carrie. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks very much, Catherine. And thank you everybody for joining us today. It, uh, it is a beautiful day. I'm uh, coming to you from Edmonton. I'm um, looking out my window and seeing the trees starting to turn. So I guess that's a, a sign that we're shifting into a different season here in Alberta, which, you know, we're used to around this time of year, I guess. Um, as far as uh, getting going here this morning, we'd like to start off by getting a sense of who is with us. So quick polls. Uh, we're going to use the polls throughout the throughout the, uh, the presentation this morning. So the first one is we'd like to know who a little bit about you a little bit more about you. And um, what best describes you in the hat you're wearing today. I think everybody is probably familiar with zoom but just give a click on uh, which one uh, best represents you and then click submit. I'll end the poll now. And I'll share the results. Excellent. All right. And Catherine, if you want to, I don't know if you, we didn't really talk about this, but if you want to screenshot that poll result, um, that might help us if we have trouble at the end uh, gathering those um, results. Got it. Thank you. Excellent. Well, good. We've got a variety of folks. So I think um, we'll have a great discussion um, based on your different experiences and, uh, and perspective on beavers today. Now, the second poll is just a little bit about where you're at in terms of um, kind of how you think you um, understand and, and know about beavers and how um, and how they influence our landscape and some of the different management practices. Evaluations are always good to, for, for reporting back to funders. So the Alberta Real Estate Foundation will be glad to know where you're at and then where you ended up after this day. One second. Um. Just launching now, sorry. I'll end it now and share the results. Okay, wonderful. Great place to start. Thank you very much. All right. So Welcome to the session. As uh, Catherine said, I am Carrie O'Shaughnessy and I'm with this organization, Cows and Fish. And um, I'm, a I'm a riparian specialist with, uh, with, the, with the organization. And um, obviously, you know, you might be wondering, well, why is an organization called Cows and Fish talking about beavers? Well, it's really about expanding um, what people know and understand about riparian landscapes and how beavers fit into them. So really, it's about thinking beyond the dam. So this, uh, this workshop, in addition to <clears throat> the, the Pigeon Lake Watershed Association partners, is also part of a collaborative that we've been working on with the Mastaki Institute for the last four or five years um, on basically uh, putting beavers to work for watershed resiliency and restoration, as it says there. So through the Alberta government's watershed restoration and resiliency program, we've been able to uh, basically build new tools, new techniques, 
and, uh, and new, new messaging around how beavers fit into our landscapes here in Alberta. So for those of you who don't know about cows and fish, uh, we are also known as the Alberta Riparian Habitat Management Society. And the name sort of right there kind of tells it all. We're about riparian management and riparian awareness and helping people better understand that part of the landscape and fostering the stewardship that, uh, that a lot of people, whether they're an individual landowner or working for a municipality or working for uh, another organization um, are trying to implement. So if you're not familiar, the riparian area, of course, is the, that area that's next to water and influenced by the water. Uh, the soils and the plants reflect that, that saturation. And lakes, wetlands, streams, rivers, um, all have a riparian area associated with them. And interesting, interestingly enough, a lot of those riparian areas are associated with beaver dams and beaver activities. And so, they are a big part of how our riparian areas and landscapes in general have evolved over time. So that's where the beaver uh, sort of fit into the riparian question. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, sort of why beavers do what they do, how they do what they do, and then how both of those things can affect and influence um, sort of the human element and where we may uh, come into conflict or, um, or not. And um, I'm really looking forward to sharing uh, with you some of my experiences um, from this, uh, in this topic over the next little bit. So in Canada, I mean, we are pretty, um, I guess, set in the ways, I guess, of the beaver, you might say. Um, we, you know, we've got a lot of place names in both streams and counties and towns and things like that, even right here in Alberta, that reflect uh, the influence of beaver on the landscape. Our, you know, money reflects it. And then just our history in general. Um, a lot of, you know, settlement and, and what drove people to, um, you know, to, to, to thrive here in the early years and then to, to, to come over and settle was around um, the lure for beaver pelts. So there's a long history that our landscape has with beaver and the way that, that it's evolved and the way that it's changed and affected just a lot of things <clears throat> um, throughout, uh, throughout Canada, but also throughout North America. And a lot of it started with the extirpation of the European beaver um, for the, uh, the fashion industry. You know, that lure for the felt that, uh, that beaver pelts provide. Um, basically early, you know, 1800s, 1700s, uh, basically drove uh, the extirpation and almost extinction of uh, this pretty incredible little rodent. So both uh, North America and um, uh, the United States and Canada, were uh, hotbeds of beaver activity and also hotbeds then for that, uh, for that fur. So by about, you know, the early 1900s, we pretty much, you know, beavers were, were removed from the landscape. And, um, and there was some early um, sort of opportunities or, or, or conservation efforts uh, put in to try and bring beaver back because even back then, you know, early 1900s, there were folks that recognized the value of beavers on the landscape and how the loss of them had, you know, had basically changed the way the landscape looked. So the, uh, the U.S. Uh, Fish and Game uh, in, in Idaho did one, uh, had one very interesting um, technique for trying to bring beavers back into their, some of, into some of their upper watersheds. This is a, a real live picture of uh, beavers being uh, parachuted into the back country of Idaho, uh, into watersheds where, uh, where they had been lost. And, um, you know, not a technique that's, that's, that's used anymore. I think this was probably only done once, um, but apparently it was, it was actually successful. You know, only one perished in the drop and, uh, and they've, they've, they've established and thrived uh, in, that, in that area. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's important as we go along. So, you know, as, uh, as, as agriculture became uh, a, a more prominent landscape um, activity uh, in Alberta, sort of in that, you know, again, 1900s on, beavers 
I guess beca they became known as a nuisance. And part of that was because, um, you know, of the of some of the challenges that they pose. But it's interesting, a lot of people say to me, you know, when I was a kid, or when my grandma, when my grandma and grandpa was a kid, uh, you know, there were no beavers here. And, uh, and that's partly because by the time, you know, our, I guess, relatives arrived, beavers had already been gone from the landscape for so long. And so now, you know, they're starting to come back because where there's habitat, there's likely going to be beaver because there were still some seed beavers left behind. So also, again, uh, sort of our more recent history, our, uh, our science and, and the people that, that we're dealing with now uh, in, these, in these more recent times are beginning to recognize the value of beaver and how they might be able to help us um, as a society sort of navigate some of the, the challenges that we're facing. So are beavers good? Are they bad? Or are they just being beaver? And really, the, the perspective often comes from you know, sort of what your experience is with them. If you've had a bad experience, you might think that they're not so great. If you haven't had a bad experience, then you may think that they are, uh, you know, that they are a good thing. But a lot of it comes down to they're just doing what they do in order to survive. So a little bit about that. Um, so you, everybody's recognized, uh, they, you know, beavers have the buck, the buck, uh, buck tooth uh, look to them. They've got that big long incisor that continues to grow throughout their life and uh, they uh, they need to chew on things, particularly wood and bark, in order to keep them from growing too long. They've got sort of that, that orangey uh, tinge to them because they are infused with iron which makes the outer layer uh, really quite strong. Typical beaver colony, when they're out there on the landscape, usually there's uh, two adults, two uh, kits of the year, and then uh, sort of two, uh, two yearlings that have, that have been around for a couple of years, making the colony, you know, sort of in one lodge be between four and six individuals. The lodge is the castle for the beaver, if you will. It's where they um, can get out of the uh, you know, get out of the elements, they can hide from predators, they can store and cache food. And then the pond around that, um, around that, that lodge is, uh, is sort of the moat of the castle. So when those young ones are two or so, they, uh, they get kicked out of the lodge and are, you know, sort of sent off on their way to, uh, to go conquer and, and master some new habitats. Um, often this is the, the time um, when a lot of the, is mortality for beaver because they're young, they're not necessarily sure, you know, what they're doing or where they're going. Um, and they, uh, the, uh, this is also when they start to uh, disperse in the springtime. Now, what's interesting is beavers are actually quite territorial. So if a young beaver goes um, you know, away, if, uh, if, they, if he's got a good relationship with his parents, the, the parents might allow him to, to stick around nearby in the, pond, you know, in the same pond or a nearby pond. But generally, if, um, you know, if a territory is already occupied and, and, uh, and that beaver's sort of gone some distance, there may be uh, you know, some territorial battles in order to, uh, to keep that uh, to whether allow that beaver to come in or not. We may have seen these uh, sort of large black mounds of, of soil kind of around uh, where beavers are active and that's their scent mounds. So they, they mark their scent with their caster and uh, that just sort of lets other beavers know that this area is occupied. So what we've talked about, you know, beavers eat, we know that they eat wood, they eat uh, sort of the, the cambium or the, the soft materials underneath the bark, and uh, they are herbivores, so uh, digesting the cellulose that is provided by, uh, by trees and shrubs. They um, utilize that wood uh, throughout the season, and if you've ever seen a lodge, I know about this time of year you start to see some sticks and, and, uh, and branches, you start to see like a pile of them out in the middle of the, uh, uh, middle of the pond, that's their food cache uh, for the winter that they're building, basically building their winter food store. Now, it's interesting, you know, beavers do a lot of activity, right? You know, they dam, they, they, they cut down trees, um, but what is it that actually triggers them to do that? And uh, the science has basically um, determined that it's the sound and movement of running water that triggers their dam building um, abilities. 
And when they're living well, within these uh, these these areas and these ponds that they're that they're damming, they they need to have a certain amount of water in order to allow that um, overwintering to happen. So when they're building their ponds, they're aiming for you know a winter drawdown of not more than about three quarters of a meter. So you know that can result in some fairly deep ponds. And then they can withstand sort of annual fluctuations of up to a meter and a half, either up or down. But this comes into play when we start talking about, you know, managing pond levels, you know, where, where are those fine lines between maintaining the beaver on the landscape, but also mitigating some of the challenges. So the dams are, are, are variable in size and shape. They are leaky. Um, they're, they're very, uh, you know, rustic looking, you might say, but also some uh, pretty strong feats of, em, of, an, of, of engineering because there's a lot of, uh, of pressure built up behind them, but those leaks in those little areas where water can, can escape, that, um, that allows those, those, those dams to stay in place for a very long time. The largest beaver dam in the world is up in Wood Buffalo National Park and is actually visible um, from Google Earth. And um, I think I heard the other day, it's been over 70 years that generations of beavers have been building on that dam. So uh, that just goes to show that, um, you know, obviously their industriousness, but also when there is a, a maintained colony, then, then things can just kind of, I guess, uh, meet a status quo and, uh, and they can just continue to build. So beavers use uh, obviously trees and shrubs for building their dams, but they'll also use cattails or rocks or anything else that might uh, just would allow them to 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 anchor those uh, those dams in place. And then the mud um, also that they bring up from the from behind the pond um, helps to sort of you know patch everything up and keep things nice and strong. Somebody told me one time too that they uh, that they had a canoe that the beavers uh, tied the, cut the rope off of and um, probably accidentally on purpose floated that canoe into the dam and, uh, and used it as well. Now I should mention at this point that if you do have any questions, um, if you want to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of uh, your screen, then we will have a question and answer session, session in, uh, in a few minutes to, to address some of those. So um, as we said, so the beavers are building those ponds basically to, uh, to create uh, an environment where they can survive. They can uh, escape from predators, they can um, access food in the winter, and um, they can you know, just basically expand, uh, expand their family unit and access food resources. Often where there's one beaver dam, there's many. And that again is, is directly linked to how they're navigating the landscape. They would prefer to be in water than on the land. So having you know, a series of ponds um, basically builds up that network of, uh, of areas where they, can be, where they can be safe. So the range of places where beavers like to live um, is varied, but typically they need to have an adequate water supply. They, uh, they, you know, they tend to be in areas of um, fairly low gradient, and they like wide valleys, but uh, but will uh, will we'll also um, work on some of the the more narrow ones as well. And they need that adequate aspen and willow supply in order for them to, because uh, that's their primary food source. So, poll three gets you guys is uh, bring you back your attention. Um, what is in a beaver's refrigerator? Do you think? What proportion of a beaver's annual diet is actually wood? The whole gamut, awesome. Good. Thank you for that. Did 
interestingly enough, annually, only about half of their diet is wood. Um, obviously, or I, I won't say obviously because it might not have might not be be that intuitive. But the winter and fall are going to be the times when they're going to have the most. Um, utility of, of the wood products. And, um, and then spring and summer, they'll eat, you know, things like cattails, grasses, sedges, pond lilies, um, you know, other aquatic plants. And just to sort of, you know, that basically rounds out, uh, rounds out their diet, but uh, definitely fall and winter, because that's where, uh, you know, those, those plants persist through the winter. Um, that's when they eat uh, the most, uh, have the most wood in their diet. And sometimes when they're, you know, they're, they're gathering that, um, that, that food, when they're going shopping for, for what they're, for their groceries, uh, it's within about 30 meters of where their main, you know, where the, where their ponds are. And, uh, and they tend to like the, 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 the trees that are about, you know, yay big about the, you know, the, the sapling size. Um, but they definitely will go after some of the larger ones as well. Um, because once they fell those, then they've got lots of little branches uh, to, to work off of. So that results in, um, you know, scenes like this, which, you know, some people get, uh, you know, quite alarmed about. But if we recognize that, you know, that beaver is just looking for their for their food supply and um, and there may be areas where this is OK and maybe where it's not. And they're also trying to perpetuate the cycle as well by cutting down those trees. They're opening up the canopy and allowing more to grow, which basically ensures, you know, uh, a perpetual food supply. So pretty cool to, to look at a beaver pond from above and just see all those little arms and um, different uh, different canals uh, going out. And basically that's again how they can extend their extend, extend their range and access uh, to food supply. And it also influences water and other wildlife activity as well as we'll talk about in a minute. So willow and aspen are the primary food product. Uh, that's what they, they really love to eat. And both of these species have evolved with beaver to, uh, to allow um, sort of that extra suckering on willows after they've been cut down. And then uh, aspen, the young ones, um, when they're really young, they develop a bit of a, a bitter taste that uh, then the beavers won't, won't bother them and let them grow up some more. So pretty cool. So lots of times um, with, the, with that activity, you know, beavers can eat themselves out of house and home. And the results of that would be, uh, you know, beaver dams failing at that point, because if a beaver is there to maintain it, then the dam is generally, uh, generally stays intact. But when they go away, there's nobody to patch it up. Um, and, uh, and then they can, they can begin to, to fall apart. So, I mean, when we look at the landscape, we can see the influence of beaver everywhere. You know, there's there's ponds, there's there's old stream channels, there's, you know, a variety of, of old dams. And as the, the cycle of water and drying and presence of drying and dams being in place and dams not, you know, it really creates a, a wonderful mosaic uh, on our landscape that we can thank the beaver for. And as mentioned, you know, they, they set the foundation for a lot of the riparian uh, areas that we have uh, here in Alberta and throughout the world. So whether it's a, a wetland or, or a lake or a stream or a river, somewhere in the watershed has probably been influenced by a beaver at some point in time. So if we think about some of the other functions of, uh, of these beaver ponds, um, you know, they can basically act like a filter. There's a lot of things that are flowing off of our landscape uh, faster and faster, you know, as, as time goes by and, and, and we continue to, to increase our activities. But the beaver ponds can actually act as a storehouse for some of that stuff where, um, you know, the plants and the uh, other, uh, other things that are going to end the organisms that are in those ponds can utilize and break down that sediment and the things that might be potentially attached to them. So the amount of, you know, sediment that can be stored in each pond, you know, can be up to 382 tandem trucks worth, which when we're thinking about, you know, soil movement and erosion and sedimentation of some of our lake basins can be a pretty huge, uh, significant thing. Also, you know, reducing the effects of, of, uh, of other things like, you know, excess nutrients, uh, fecal coliforms, Improved, uh, improved dissolved oxygen, which is good for fish. 
the, the, the pond actually does some really good, uh, really good things. So from the water quality standpoint, we can see some benefits. We can also see some benefits from, you know, water supply. So just looking at uh, looking at a, at a beaver pond, they've got the ability to, particularly in dry years like this, have the some of the only surface water that we can see, and then that um, also influences what we can, what we can't see um, underground. So. I think this, uh, if somebody did a study this year, you know, they might find a similar situation than was done um, back in, uh, in 2008, where, um, you know, nine times more open water and, and uh, uh, was available on the landscape because of the presence of beaver. So those canals, if you've ever walked out in the landscape and fallen into a beaver, a beaver run, um, <laughs> you might curse a bit. Hopefully you didn't roll your ankle too badly. Um, but that's again, how they expand that water storage capacity. You know, that water that's sitting there slowed down can soak into the groundwater. It can soak into the soils and the shallow groundwater nearby and continue to persist uh, with water downstream. And it's that influence of not only the surface water that is so beneficial for so many things, but also the, uh, the groundwater um, contributing to uh, you know, moisture right around the pond, but then also seeping out slowly throughout the year um, to downstream so that we actually can, can have water in our systems longer throughout the year. So if I was going to sum it up, I would say that the beaver ponds are, you know, sort of responsible for retention, detention, storage, and slow release. That if we were going to try and construct that, um, you know, with other kinds of, of infrastructure, it uh, can be very costly, whereas the beavers are, are doing that for free, basically. And there's evidence now um, as well that uh, that having uh, beaver ponds on the landscape can be a beneficial uh, a benefit for fire protection, and uh, and mitigating the the impacts of fire, and um, I think that's that's a pretty cool um, aspect. You know, more moisture on the land means you know, hopefully uh, less less ability for fires to burn so hot, and hopefully less ability for them to spread so quickly. And when we think about flooding and, and drought, you know, there's also the aspect of, you know, beaver dams create and the ponds create like a step pool system throughout a watershed. So, you know, instead of water just racing down, uh, racing down a valley or racing down a channel, it has the ability to, to stop for a minute, slow down, um, you know, dampen that flood peak and also uh, damage or um, hopefully reduce the damage that some of that flood peak can happen. They're not going to stop that flooding, they just slow it down. And then the, um, you know, beavers are a keystone species. So pulsing with life, these beaver ponds are with so many different, uh, different animals and plants uh, utilizing those areas that without beaver ponds, in some cases, we may not have some of those species. Um, as you've seen, you know, you've probably heard the stat, um, you know, that 80% of all of our wildlife and 100% of our fish, you know, rely on riparian lands. Uh, well, that that holds true for beavers ponds as well. They contribute to that and everything from, you know, the big things to the little things that uh, the big things eat. And if you're interested in that sort of thing, you know, some really interesting research about, you know, the movement of amphibians and how um, you know, those, those canals and, and different uh, pond connections actually allow um, populations to disperse and interact uh, in, in, some, in some landscapes, which uh, again, without that water, without that moisture, uh, they wouldn't be able to do that. So if we were gonna sum it up, um, I've got this slide up here, but I'd like to share a little video with you if it works. Um, to summarize sort of the value and um, of beaver as well as sort of how they, they do what they do. Hi there, my name is Megan and I'm an interpreter here at Pigeon Lake Provincial Park. I'm hanging out today near this beautiful 
beautiful wetland in search of my dear friend Bucky the beaver who lives nearby. I wonder if anybody has seen them. Over here! Bucky! Bucky! My goodness, Bucky! You sure seem out of breath. What have you been up to these days? Oh, Megan! I've been working my tail off trying to dam up the streams that flow into Pigeon Lake. You're welcome, by the way. It does seem a little bit odd that I should be thanking you for stopping the flow of water into Pigeon Lake. Don't you think? Not at all. As you well know, my dams go a long way to keeping that lake in tip-top condition. That is true. You do create a very beautiful eco ecosystems where a lot of my favorite critters call home. Like the songbirds or the waterfowl that build their nests along the ponds, or that sneaky red fox that's in search of a, a tasty treat. This place sure would be a lot quieter with you not around. That's completely true. And I mean, my dams do stop the water from reaching the lake initially, but by capturing that water and releasing it slowly throughout the year, my dams contribute to more consistent water availability. I contribute to flood prevention and drought prevention, and in return, I get a safe place to hide from predators. It's a win-win. I'm glad that you're pleased with this arrangement. Did you know that Pigeon Lake has had blue-green algae blooms in the past? I had no idea. So, your dams are helping by cooling off some of the water heading towards the lake and helping to remove some of that excess nutrients so the water that's heading to Pigeon Lake is cleaner, thus helping to slow down the blooms of blue-green algae. So thank you. I had no idea, and I mean I'm glad that I helped. I guess when fast flowing water enters my pools, it does give the sediment a chance to settle down to the bottom and trap some of those agricultural nutrients from fertilizers, as well as heavy metals. And that doesn't bother me, especially because a lot of the plants that live around the edge of my wetlands tend to eat up those extra nutrients. And I guess I do build my pools pretty deep, which cools down the water, but mostly that's because I need a place to hide and store my food. But I guess if it helps out my fish friends and my human friends downstream, that's even better. Well, I'm glad that we're both on the same side of Lake Health, Bucky. Today, we've had a really fun time talking, but I know that we haven't always seen eye to eye as beaver and human, but there's a lot that we can do for each other. And if we just keep an open mind, we can help to keep the lake clean. You know what? I couldn't agree more. I propose a toast. Aha! Uh -huh. To Lake Health. Hi there. So that's. Uh, hopefully that works for everybody. But that's a great little local tidbit that uh, that Pigeon Lake has there. Um, on uh, summarizing, you know, some of the benefits and values of of beaver. So at this point, I think we'll open it up to questions on that section. Carrie, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. All right, we have a few questions. Okay. Uh, Bob, Bob has asked, how long does a lodge remain active or occupied? That will depend on a variety of factors. Um, if if there's nothing, you know, uh, res, uh, you know, causing that beaver to to leave, then that family can persist for 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 a number of years. You know, up to thirty um, in some cases. So it really depends on uh, on the surroundings and and what that beaver has to keep it there. Okay, thank you. Um, Kim has asked. Uh, or let us know that beavers may be made a cameo appearance of Pigeon Lake um, when the family, including young kids, were on the dock last weekend. Um, she said it feels like it came off the shore from behind us and thought it odd that he was there. Uh, do you think it was um, a swim by um, to some little tributary? It could be. It's very, very, very possible. Um, I know there are beavers um, in Pigeon Lake because they took down a tree on a project that we were working on. Um, so yeah, yep, could be a swim by, could be, uh, uh, you know, on his way somewhere else. 
Um, could we just come into the lake for, for, for something? Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, or hard to know. And there may be, I don't know if anybody knows, but you know, maybe there's actually some bank lodges or, or things like that uh, along the shoreline. Um, I'm along, along Pigeon too, could be going there. I think it is a shoreline beaver. We have had sightings. I, I've seen it a couple times now at Sundance and I know the administration at Sundance has indicated there is a beaver um, along the shoreline here. So it's probably come from our neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> Kim mentioned that um, she didn't think they would live in a lake. Can you explain a bit more about the shoreline and the and beavers? Mm -hmm. the yeah. So the there's 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 two ways that beavers can uh, can sort of build their lodges, and one is uh, against uh, a bank. So that could be a river bank, a stream bank, or or a lake shoreline. So they'll just they'll bury into uh, into that bank edge. Or they can have, you know, more of a pond out, or a, more of a, a lodge out in open water um, that 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 starts out quite shallow, but then floods. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the lake is water. It's a place that uh, that that they can that they can hide. And also in this in a dry year like this, Pigeon Lake might be one of the only places that has a lot of surface water. <laughs> uh, too, some of the smaller ponds may have dried up. So. Um, so likely they are they're using the area either for a for a for a bank lodge or um, just for getting to other food sources. I see. Thank you. And Bob has said, is a mound that's out in the open water a lodge or just a food stash? So if it's a mound raised above the water that is uh, mud and sticks then that's a lodge. If it's, um, you know, branches, it just looks like there's like branches and, and, uh, and things and leaves and things like that sticking out of the water, then that's a food cache. So they take those branches and they actually stick them into the, into the bed um, or into the bottom of their, their lodge. And then uh, some of them are completely submerged and, uh, and they just continue to stack that stack that food cache. So um, if it's, if it, if it looks kind of like a dam, but it's in a mound, then that's a lodge. Okay. Thank you. And that's everything for questions right now, Carrie. Okay. Excellent questions. Uh, thank you very much. And I must admit, I cannot see any of you. So um, I, I appreciate you putting those questions into the chat boxes and the Q and A box. All right. So the, the Pigeon Lake video, um, you know, give us a good segue into talking about the next aspect of um, sort of uh, repair of, uh, of beavers, and that's the beaver human conflict side. So I'd like to know uh, through this poll, sort of what kind of interactions have you had with beaver and what might some of your conflicts be? And this is the biggest one, just pick one, what would be the biggest? Okay, I'll just end the poll. Uh, the whole gamut. All right. Good. All right. I think we'll address most of those, I hope. Good. So I think it's, you know, it's no surprise that that with more water on the landscape or with where beavers are, are, are building, they can pose uh, some issues. And, um, you know, they they cheerfully ignore our property lines. They they don't really, you know, doesn't matter to them <laughs> where the water is or where the dam is. Um, they 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 choose those spots either based on 
historic on you know historical use of particular areas or where again where they think they can um, stop that flow of water and uh, and get the habitat that they need. So some of those issues that that people have probably seen around the landscape might include flooded agricultural fields, flooded access roads and crossings, uh, flooded fence lines. Um, in recreational situations, you know, down trees across trails, burrowing through through trails, as well as uh, you know, damming. This is an impressive dam on the right hand side here, um, courtesy of, uh, of of a fellow out at uh, Cooking Lake Blackfoot Provincial uh, Recreation Area, where the beavers dammed essentially right up the top of a bridge and over top of it. Um, you know, affecting you know soils in places that we might not expect. Um, you know, so adding moisture in places again that we need to be aware of. Um, you know, what if you're a beaver, knowing what we talked about just in the, you know the, the early part of the session, you know, what does that big road look like right there? A dam with a hole in it. Uh, the culvert is the hole, and culverts are loud and metal, and again, that's the kind of thing that attracts a beaver to to start damming. So it's no wonder that we have so many culvert issues um, on a lot of our roads. Here's an example of one of those uh, buried beneath that pile of sticks is a culvert. Um, they can be super industrious, a place that we plug the thing from top to bottom. And the result of that, you know, again, is, is flooding is flooded roads that municipalities have a real challenge in trying to manage. Some of the beaver canals that uh, that they create, you know, can sometimes create little sinkholes or air pockets, which can you know, cause threats to, to animal uh, safety as well as human safety. And they love to chew trees, but they also love to chew other things. So there's this on the left is a phone cable. And, uh, and on the right, you might have heard a little while back where, um, you know, beavers basically took out internet in it for an entire city. And for those in the agricultural industry, you know, PVC pipe, is a uh, also a wonderful thing uh, for beavers to chew. So being aware of where beavers are and what they can do basically helps us bake and, and land managers make better decisions about you know, how we build that infrastructure in. Uh, we've talked about the wood thing, you know, they they love to chew trees and they'll they'll take, you know. They like ones of certain size, but they'll also go after the big ones. And again, if it's out in the open, you know, out in the back 40, it probably doesn't matter too much, you know, that beavers are taking those trees down. But when it does uh, become an issue might be when they're, you know, coming up onto your yard and taking out your prized uh, maple or something like that. And these scenes, you know, again, Hopefully, maybe when we started this, you were you were thinking, oh my gosh, you know, that's a terrible thing. But now you're starting to recognize that, okay, I know now why that beaver did that. And it also adds some roughness and um, and uh, uh, friction to the to the ground as well. So if there's runoff or, or snowpack, you know, that can be captured and slow that water down. So busy, busy, um, these beavers are. And uh, again, sometimes that, that doesn't really go so well with what we want to do. So let's think about some of the beaver management options because you know, lots of times we gravitate to, to sort of two primary wet methods of dealing with beaver. And, um, and in a lot of cases haven't really even thought about, well, there might be other ways uh, to mitigate some of these things. So we're going to touch on a few. We're not going to touch on them all, um, but we'll we'll start this conversation. So these are the uh, I'll call them the conventional um, management uh, techniques. You know, blowing the blowing the dam, throwing a stick of dynamite in there, and and taking them out or removing it with with machinery, and the result of that is draining the pond. So if we're concerned or 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 want to maintain some of those values this one doesn't necessarily achieve that goal. The other uh, the general method is, uh, is lethal and live trapping. So this is basically population management, taking out uh, the beaver, what we, you know, air quotes, problem beavers. Um, and essentially any removal of beaver in Alberta is, uh, is generally lethal because um, relocation 
is actually not a permitted activity uh, in Alberta. So it's actually illegal to transport a beaver from one spot to another um, without a special permit. So this idea and cycle of, of removing the beaver dams, removing the beaver, particularly if you know, the habitat is good, is kind of one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't situations. Because there won't be any beaver activity there for a year or two or three or four or five, but they're eventually going to move back in. So sometimes that's what you need. You, know, you need that reprieve. And so perhaps those tools um, um, are, are suitable in that situation, or maybe you can't have any ponding in a, in a particular location and that's your only option. Um, but there are lots of places where if this is going to continue to be a thing, you know, well, maybe there's a way that we can live with that beaver instead of, um, you know, taking it out. So this is uh, an example of a study that's, that's done in Alberta here, um, where 52 um, sort of agencies were, were approached and responded to a survey about, you know, what do they tend to gravitate to in terms of, um, you know, beaver management strategies. And you'll see that shooting and trapping are the two uh, highest. And all these other different things are, um, you know, definitely way, way lower down um, on the list. And the study also, um, uh, yeah, so including flow devices, which we're going to talk about in a minute, they're, they're low down right now. So what that equates to in this study is a combined annual cost of over $3 million in equipment costs, manpower costs for going out and trapping and shooting and, um, and, dam, and dam removal, which is a ton of dollars. So I've I sort of tossed in this word coexistence um, as we've been as we've been chatting uh, this morning, and basically, beaver coexistence strategies and tools are designed to um, deal with problems associated with beaver activity, but also prevent them, um, become an alternative manage uh, alternative strategy for for man for maintaining or managing beaver conflict. Just another tool in the toolbox. In a lot of cases, they can be more efficient and more cost effective compared to some of the, the usual techniques. And it also allows us to maintain beavers and their ponds on the landscape for the benefits. So both economic, environmental, social and cultural. And some examples um, of, uh, of those coexistence tools are things like pond levelers, culvert protectors and tree wrapping, to name a couple. So since about 2016, we've kind of been gathering a little bit of information about, you know, where where some of these um, coexistence tools are being employed. And um, prior to 2016, there wasn't that that many jurisdictions doing it. Um, this also about this time kind of coincides with when the collaborative started up. So we've been doing a lot of education, awareness, and then workshops on 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 trying out some of these different tools. And since then. Um, you know, things have really started to, to, to grow. So there's a lot more places trying different techniques and, um, and it's really fantastic to see, um, you know, that we're still in early days on a lot of these things, but they're starting to get, uh, get tested around. And incidentally, um, last year, uh, one of the pond levelers was um, put in by a, a Pigeon Lake Provincial Park staff. So somewhere in the park, uh, there is a, a pond leveler that um, may be of interest. Um, I'm hoping to get out there in the next couple of weeks to check it out. Another uh, way to get a sense of what's happening around these coexistence tools in Alberta is uh, the rockies.ca website and their map of tools. And it's a pretty cool thing. It's interactive online. You can, can check out Alberta, click on a location, and uh, and get a sense of 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 what's going what's going on. I checked, and the Pigeon Lake one isn't on here. So if anybody knows Pigeon Lake staff and they want to, um, maybe they want to toss it uh, toss it on this map. So poll five, I'd like to know: Have any of you tried anything to coexist with beavers?
Excellent. Good. Be interested to follow that up. So one of the, the techniques uh, dealing with the tree issue and the beavers taking down trees um, is a very common uh, technique and that's the, the, the wire wrapping. And uh, there's a couple of different uh, points or tips that I can give you if this is something that you're, that you're interested in doing or that you're doing. Um, on the right hand side is an example of a, a successful wire wrap where it was quite wide around uh, the tree that um, allows both the tree to grow um, so that you don't end up with the situation on the left where the tree ends up growing into the wire and girdling it and potentially killing the tree anyway. Um, the good thing that is on the left is that the wire is quite tall. So you always you wanna do about a meter high because that, uh, that allows, you know, gives you lots of room um, for beaver to, uh, you know, not be able to climb up or reach, uh, reach over, uh, particularly in winter. And so, so that, that meter is a, is a good, a good minimum height. And also by going, giving the tree a bit of a wider berth, it, uh, it, it doesn't give, you know, the beaver can't just chew, you know, chew inside there um, in such a way. And it's, of course, right down to the bottom um, of the tree as well. So thinking about, again, how to deter or, or change the way that beaver might be utilizing trees um, is the idea of bribery. So there's a, a landowner uh, down south, and I've seen it happen in a couple other places as well, where, you know, if there's a copious amount of aspen around and um, you want to try and uh, protect some, some prize trees, is this particular producer basically creates a feeding station, takes down um, a bunch of aspen limbs, uh, puts them out uh, for the beavers to basically just to, to, to utilize. It's like a beaver, a beaver buffet. And they're like anything, you know, if it's easy, if it's provided for them, they're going to utilize that not only for building materials, but also for, uh, for eating. And also, you know, the trigger and the sound of water, there's examples where, you know, beavers were doing damming on a place where the, uh, the landowner didn't want. And so putting a, a, the, a, you know, a tape recorder or this old ghetto blaster um, in a location where they, they would prefer the beaver uh, did their thing. Um, lots of times the day after that, that tape recorder was put out, it was buried with mud and sticks. So that sound drew them to a different location. And landowners are really, uh, you know, they're ingenious and ingenu um, they've got some ingenuity in that way. You know, lots of times trying, uh, trying different things um, um, on their own, they get a little bit of information and, and they run with it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but I think that's the same with everything. So, uh, so it's been kind of neat to, to learn from, from different landowners who, who have, tried, uh, have tried some of these techniques and um, learned, learned from them in terms of what worked, what didn't. This is an example with a really quick, you know, temporary uh, situation. He just wanted to reduce the flooding of his wintering field. And so, you know, tossed the cage on the end of some PVC pipe, stuck it through the dam. Unfortunately, by spring, because it was too short, the beavers had basically plugged up the whole thing. So that was a learning for him. Now he uses the longer, uh, the longer length of pipe and he uses a plastic pipe instead of PVC. Um, for roads and culvert uh, protection, um, there's a couple different ways that uh, that, that can be done. Uh, this is a culvert, uh, a T culvert protector that is basically an extension um, onto a culvert uh, where uh, there's quite a deep hole dug on the upstream side here. And uh, this T on the end is graded on the top and the bottom and the beaver can't plug it up um, above um, or or below. This one is pretty intense and is probably best done if um, you know a new road is a new culvert is being put into a road. Um, the situation that was a situation here. These two uh, original culverts were collapsed and and needed to replace be replaced. So they took advantage of that and uh, and tried that technique. And there's a bit a bit of a sort of cost analysis done on that and. Um, it cost about $35,000 to put them in. So a high investment up front, um, but they uh, only had to do, you know, five to $10,000 uh, worth of maintenance now. 
So I think that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Oh, sorry, I read that wrong. They've required no further maintenance. Um, that installation cost has been recouped by saving five to 10,000 annually from having to go back to that location all the time to, to clear it out or, or whatever. So the other uh, sort of another way to protect culverts is through through fencing, um, what we would call an exclusion fence. And this is an example of one that actually didn't really work very well. Uh, you can see that there's still lots of, of mud and things that the beaver somehow got in there um, to, to, to dig it up and probably because there wasn't a floor put in on this fence and also the shape didn't really help it either. So an example of where a different uh, sort of strategy was tried is uh, Lac St. Anne County. So similar situation, you know, plugged culvert. The, the I'll say standard grate was put in front. There was also a, a cone uh, within inside there. Um, these flat grates um, definitely do prevent the beaver from getting into the culvert, but it doesn't necessarily prevent the damming situation because again, they've just said, thank you very much. I now have a flat um, piece to, to dam on and away we go. So through workshop uh, back in 2017, uh, they tried this uh, sort of idea of, a, of a, a trapezoidal exclusion fence. So the culvert, you know, is here and then the fence extends. Um, this picture on the bottom is cut off. I apologize for that. Um, but it, it basically culvert is here and the fence extends out to the side in a bit of an angle um, and then reinforced with, with this wood header. Uh, the county was a little bit nervous about this kind of idea, so they left the grate in, um, but ended taking ended up we ended up taking it out a couple years later. The grate, the fence stayed in. So I mean they're not maintenance free, um, and uh, in this case the the design was was a little bit um, off because we were quite close to the banks here. Ideally there would be, would, be, would have been more space between the edge of the fence and uh, and the sides. So the beavers eventually did figure out that they could just dam on the structure. So um, just after some some negotiations with the county and uh, and some some hard work by by one of the members uh, in the uh, staff um, out there, we basically kept the, kept the fence in and um, and added a pipe to it. So this is essentially a pond leveler added to the fence and, uh, and now they haven't had any trouble with it since. And it's also been uh, quite dry these last few, uh, particularly this year. So that's not an issue. And in the end, the grate was taken out because it actually made the culvert really, really loud. And we think that might have been why the beavers didn't give up on this fence is they could still hear that water, um, that water running. So, so far this, is, this, this combo device is working uh, pretty effectively. So that shape that I was talking about, that, that actually becomes really quite important if you're gonna try this without a pipe. Um, by making that, you know, sort of a large fence, if you've got the room to have, you know, that, 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 that distance of water all the way out to the end, basically means that if a beaver is gonna dam this, they have to dam, you know, a way longer area and also as they dam up the sides, it basically pushes the water out and makes it flow slower uh, into that culvert. So again, minimizing that, that, that noise and that trigger that, uh, so beavers will, will potentially, um, you know, just give up, uh, give up on this. And if they don't, then there's always the option to add that pipe. So investments up front, uh, yes, but, Again, the long-term um, benefit uh, should be realized in not too much time. So we are talking about water and doing things in water. So this next poll is just, you know, what do you think? Are there regulations and laws that apply to beaver coexistence strategy?
yeah, split between the yes and the not sure. Awesome, good. Yeah, so the short answer is yes. Um, it's interestingly enough that, um, you know, there's there's been exemptions written into the Water Act as well as the Public Lands Act, and in some cases, the Fisheries Act for, um, for, for people to, to remove dams and remove beavers. But if you wanna try and coexist with them, you have to jump through all the hoops in a lot of cases um, in order to, uh, you know, in order to have that, that activity approved. So you might have to look uh, into Water Act, public lands, uh, temporary field authorizations, um, department license of occupation, sometimes depending on, on the situation, as well as uh, uh, Fisheries Act if you're working in fish bearing streams. And unfortunately in Alberta right now, this is not super consistent. Um, some places require it, some places don't. So we, we, we uh, through the collaborative and through the Mastaki Institute are, are sort of trying to to work with some of the regulatory agencies to, to streamline the process a little bit, um, just like a lot of other stewardship and, and sort of restoration activities. Um, but uh, so our main our main advice right now is, um, you know, if you're not already doing something related to a road, uh, for example, for, through a municipality, is always check um, before installation in terms of what might be uh, might be required. So here's an example where um, Beaver County, this is now going to be probably seven or eight years ago now, embarked on a, on a study to see with the University of Alberta, you know, what can we change for mitigating human beer conflict? So same issues as a lot of places, you know, blocked culverts, uh, trying the, the usual things and, 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 and just not working. Um, so they uh, embarked on installing um, a number of these pond levelers or a flexible pipe. So what a pond leveler basically is, is it's a, it's a uh, this was 20 feet here, but it should be 40 feet length of pipe that extends from the outlet end of the dam to an upstream location where uh, the intake cage is, uh, or the inlet end of the pipe is protected by a cage that is big enough that the beaver can't feel that suction. And then the outlet end is set at the height of the pond that you want to mitigate. So in this case, they had freestanding dams and culverts. So they ended up doing a, a combo, but that is the idea of how the pond leveler works. So that allows you to keep the pond and the beaver happy, uh, but also continue to keep water moving throughout the season until it reaches that height. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions on design um, on that, so we'll we'll address those uh, uh, later on or in a, even in, in a follow up session. So what is that? So what does a pond leveler kind of look like in real life? Here's an example of one through a freestanding dam. There's that intake cage that's being floated out to the upstream side of the pond, and then uh, dropped into the water, and then the outlet end is um, on the downstream side of the dam. This one is a little poking a little bit far out past the dam. Um, might now now we know a few more things. We might have dro um, dro brought it back a little bit. It's still functioning, um, but that's just a, a you know a bit of a, a tip there. And then this is what it looks like once it's in place. So these um, again aren't maintenance free necessarily. Uh, this is an Abrazo County example where this was a beaver dam complex. So there was pond after pond after pond and we put in two levelers, one on the upstream pond and one on the downstream pond. And beavers generally don't dam things from the downstream side of their dams unless they can swim right up to it. So in this case, uh, the water was quite high. There wasn't a huge drop here. So they started to plug up the bottom, uh, the bottom end and uh, so the, the mitigation there was just add a, uh, a bit of mesh on that out, uh, outlet end, dam it up, so, or cover it up with sticks. So again, beavers can continue to do that activity if they would like, but they can't block that outlet. So now in those situations, we basically, if we're, if we're helping with the project, we recommend you just put that grade on right away or that mesh on an angle right away 
and uh, and hopefully mitigate that from happening at all. The uh, materials that um, that are being utilized in, in, in some places, uh, particularly if you're if uh, you're working with somebody like me, because this is what I've been learned on or trained on, <clears throat> um, is uh, a double wall high density polyethylene pipe. So basically a, a black culvert that's corrugated on the outside and smooth on the inside. And that adds structural integrity as well as makes the sound of water, again, a lot quieter. So reduces that, that instinct. Uh, this is a, a single wall pipe that um, was not submerged and the beavers just chewed right through it. So that's the other aspect of the double wall. If they do get a hankering for chewing on it, it'll take them a bit. Um, because they'll have to go through basically two layers of pretty strong, pretty strong stuff. So single wall can be used if it's a situation where the pipe can maintain completely submerged or be completely uh, covered up. Because again, these are a lot louder and they're a lot thinner. So just back to uh, sort of the, the beaver, uh, the beaver county uh, example. You know, this again, this was a culvert situation. So they ended up with a, a, a combo, um, a culvert protector here, and then the, the, the pipe through the dam. And um, as part of just getting them in there, they did, you know, not only they actually did some, some human um, surveying about, you know, what, what people's attitudes are towards beavers, but they also did some cost benefit analysis again with Glynis Hood. So Saving in, man in management and maintenance costs over three years basically netted $65,000. And that's just in operational costs. If they, uh, uh, Glynis also built in, or Dr. Hood uh, built in also, you know, wetland value into that. And again, that, that benefit became, you know, upwards of $380,000. Average cost, kind of right around that $1,000 mark, I would say that's gone up in the last few years, just based on price of materials. And then their maintenance and monitoring costs were really low um, after after those three years and they continue to monitor them. And as far as I know, um, haven't gotten to the point yet where they've had to replace any or, or having any additional issues. In addition, sort of in that, so still in that beaver, um, Beaver County area, the Cooking Lake Blackfoot Provincial Recreation Area, put an additional 12 devices in. And um, you can see here that their cumulative monitoring and maintenance for the pond levelers, um, again, over that three years was about $17,000. And the annual, the annual park management expenses before that was over $100,000. So I think that's a, a pretty incredible um, cost savings right there. And so it became, again, a different way of utilizing their staff and where they spent the money. And that resulted essentially in, you know, a 90% cost saving in terms of at every site, you know, they didn't have to go back and spend that, that equipment time and that manpower time you know, several times within a season. Um, they just had to check it once or twice a year, maybe clear some debris, you know, add some material, you know, or, you know, uh, maybe mesh here or there if things started to fall apart, but, but pretty minimal. Elk Island National Park, same thing. Um, you know, some, again, data collected through this study, the total that cost they were spending at sites before was around you know 2,800 bucks and dropped that down to about a thousand. So, uh, and that's just for four locations in Elk Island Park. Uh, I throw this in there because uh, Smoky Lake County has actually been using what they call a gizmo for a lot of years. It's a it's completely different design. Um, it's uh, more based on one of the original ideas around the pond levelers, but they've worked it in over the years into their program. So it's, they haven't gone you know, completely one way and completely the other. They're utilizing all these different tools. And uh, it's just another, another tool um, in their toolbox. And they've got, I think they've got way more locations, uh, locations now, but at this time, that's what they, that's what they had. So that's, I just think that's interesting that there are some 
some counties that have been imploring these techniques for a while. Um, I just bring you to uh, a US example just to show again that there's other jurisdictions that are that are looking into these things and utilizing them. Um, they've got really high success rates in Massachusetts. One of the, I guess you could call them the gurus of these flow devices is from there and uh, has been installing over 1500 of these over the last few years and has had you know an over 95% success rate on some of these and um, a lot of them stay in place for um, you know up to 10 years. Um, so these ones were culvert success and this is at, at dams, um, freestanding dams. And they also do trapping uh, in Massachusetts. And um, this is an interesting graph. It just shows that, you know, the effectiveness of trapping in the first year or so is really high, you know, at, at mitigating whatever the problem was. Um, but of course that declines over time, particularly in good habitat because the beavers come back. Whereas with installing these devices, it kind of held steady um, um, over that time. And they didn't have to, you know, the effectiveness was a lot longer term. The problem didn't recur. And if you're interested in learning, you know, investigating more about the sort of cost benefits of these things, um, you know, there's examples, um, again, in Massachusetts, as well as Virginia, where, um, you know, the municipalities are seeing huge savings by, by, by employing some of these different techniques in different places. So it really is, I think, about, you know, thinking about the watershed scale and where, you know, everybody fits in and, and when we're doing our municipal planning and actually thinking, you know, can we add beaver to the table? You know, where can beaver, you know, come into this thing? And now I'm going to pick a little bit on the Pigeon Lake Watershed Management Plan just because it's, 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 it's fresh. But I just went to look in there and just see, you know, if beaver was even mentioned. And uh, interestingly enough, it wasn't. It didn't come up at all. And I checked also the Leduc, you know, some of the, the local county, um, Leduc and Wetaskiwin County um, inter, uh, intermunicipal development plans as well. And beavers aren't really mentioned in there either. So I'm wondering, you know, if maybe there's a next step here in thinking about, you know, where can beavers play a role in these different management plans? And part of it is awareness, you know, it's just helping people learn more about these different techniques and di uh, different tools. Um, there's lots of uh, materials that have been developed over the years in terms of fact sheets, as well as some, you know, how to videos and the different, uh, different resources that way. There's um, fact sheets and, 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 uh, and booklets that, that Cows and Fish has put together along with the Mastaki Institute to, to help get the word out. And if uh, you know you want to learn more about some of these things, keep checking back um, on those websites, both the cows and fish one and uh, and the Mustaki one at Rockies.ca. And um, you know there's a mailing list to get updates on on things that are happening, and uh, and explore the map of tools. So it really is about vision and about creating a tolerance and figuring out, you know, where some of these different coexistence tools are most suitable. In some places, like I said earlier, they're not going to be an option. Um, but I think this hopefully gives people a sense that, okay, maybe we don't have to default to the same thing all the time. Um, and there, we may be able to try some different things in certain places. And riparian areas are super resilient, right? They're super dynamic. They're changing all the time and beavers play a big role in that. And um, it's really neat to see, you know, the way that, that landscapes can respond. But if we can, you know, maintain a scene like this for a longer period of time, we're gonna gain those benefits for a longer period of time instead of having to restart and kickstart that process every single time, you know, we, we drain that pond. And what we really need is, is time to figure this stuff out and the space to allow it to work. So um, again, this gets to that point of, you know, where are these things suitable and where are they not? And do we value what beavers provide for us enough to start to think about these different options? So with that, I think that's all for the content. Um, 
I think what we might do uh, before we get into questions and before people might run away is just really quickly uh, do up these, uh, these surveys here. Um, and then hopefully you'll stick around for, for the question and answer. So this is just the after question, you know, so far what you've heard, um, what, uh, where do you think things are at? Excellent. Everybody's improved some knowledge. That's awesome. I'm glad. And then the next one is just a little bit more specific about what you're going to take away from today. And again, this one is like your top, the top thing. Hopefully you learned a little bit about everything, but what's your top? All right, good. Excellent. Okay, so thanks to the funders, thanks to the partners, thanks to the people at Cows and Fish that let us do what we do. And if you want to get a hold of any of us after this, there are some contacts for you. All right. So questions. We have a few questions. Okay. Um, and, and one comment from me. Um, I would like to say I, I very much agree that we should all consider next steps in terms of how these kinds of uh, items can be incorporated into our watershed management plans. The Pigeon Lake Watershed Management Plan does include beavers and beaver okay. management. Um, it's, it's just um, hidden, and I'm not surprised uh, you didn't find it. It's under okay. clean runoff. And it's mm. objective 3D called okay. management, manage okay. populations and nature, uh, natural structures and tributaries to promote nutrient trapping while adequately protecting infrastructure and property. The well, primary... that's interesting because I searched that thing <laughs> and <laughs> couldn't find the word beaver in there at all. So I'm glad. Yes. Hidden that's great clean runoff yeah that's great um, yeah even and, i put the word beaver in as a find and it didn't come up so uh so it is tough to find because it's under clean runoff um great so the questions now um and there are a few um so we had one in the chat which i'm hoping you can respond as well what is the collaborative you spoke about um and this was from alexis in edmonton yeah, so the collaborative is when I introduced at the beginning with the Mastaki Institute and Cows and Fish, where we're putting, it's called Putting Beavers to Work for Watershed Resiliency and Restoration. So the Mastaki Institute is a policy um, sort of organization. So they've been doing a lot of research on um, policies and guidelines and tools. Um, they, they did a, a great fact sheet about, um, about cost benefit analysis as well as uh, put together a, a regulatory challenges document. Um, they host symposiums and things like that. And then Cows and Fish contributes to that, that research as well as we do the extension and education and uh, training, um, things like this. Um, so working together to, 
to bring more messages out about beavers in addition to what cows and fish usually does which you know is we, we talk a lot about grazing management or urban management and restoration but adding beaver into that mix okay thank you jason asked um we have a neighbor upstream that consistently traps beavers on our river we still have beavers on our part of the river and they are very active but will increased activities here negatively impact the uh, possibility of flooding of our property would it be better to convince our neighbors to allow the beavers to live along the entire river um i'm just going to read that question uh we have any other Will increased activity here negatively impact the possibility of flooding on our property? We better convince the neighbors to allow the beaver. Yeah, so it's um, the neighbor. The neighbor question is is a good one. I I do think that it is um, a, a bigger picture view to to provide beaver with more opportunities to do what they do. So if 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 you've got the beavers on on your side um, and they're 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 flooding him upstream i'm guessing is why he's taking the beavers out um then it may be a situation where yeah if you could convince him to keep some and maybe put in some pond levelers to again to keep water moving which mitigates his flooding issue or that flooding issue upstream um and then also doesn't uh, compound the issue onto yours. Great. Um, okay, thank you. And Jason asked, do beavers only like to eat, eat live wood? Yeah, great question. As far as I know, yes. Um, it's because it would be the most nutritious for them as from the, from the tree and shrub perspective. And then they'll also eat other things, but from the, the tree and shrub, shrub perspective as far as i know they only eat the live stuff okay and another question there's a huge and very controversial flood mitigation program in the works here in drumheller and i don't know if uh beaver are considered i plan to look into it do you have any idea have you heard anything no haven't heard about that one um but i know it's a it's a common thing so Definitely. That's awesome, Jason. Do look into it. And from Bob, is there such a thing as beaver overpopulation or does nature balance itself out? Um, that is a natural predation, et cetera. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, overpopulation, I think, is a perception thing, I, actually, because you know, the, we don't really have a really good understanding of what our beaver populations are or what the capacities are for beaver uh, for habitat. So um, generally, as natural cycles do, if there gets to be too many of one thing in one place, something will balance it out. Usually it's nature. So either through disease or through predation. Um, but we also have to remember that we've reduced a lot of the predators that wouldn't would would naturally take beaver you know so we've changed where the we've changed where the bears are and how many there are we've changed where the cougars are we've changed you know where the coyotes are um so so i think like as, as a general concept yes there is a such a thing as beaver overpopulation which would then result in a in a nature taking its course um but what we have is i think localized perceptions or 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 idea is that there's an, uh, an overpopulation of beaver because they're they're affecting things that maybe they haven't affected before for us. So we just sort of say, okay, there's too many beavers. Um, so so it's, it's a good question because we don't have a good sense of what, what our populations are here. Okay, thank you, Carrie. That wraps up all the questions. And I would just like to say thank you very much for uh, presenting today. It was, it's, it's helpful to see alternative methods and understand uh, the costs or cost savings, um, as well as the, the benefits and, for our ecosystem and the challenges that we face and there are different types as well. 
Um, I think perhaps from my perspective, another opportunity will be to talk about beavers along the shoreline and specifically how we might be able to manage that. Uh, but for today, thank you very much. I'd like to also mention um, Pigeon Lake Watershed Association will be hosting Watershed 101 on November 4th. This session was designed um, given that we have new council members around the lake. Uh, there, are, there have been a number of municipal elections. And so as a refresher or for new councillors, we invite you to attend. This session will identify the geographic characteristics and boundaries of the Pigeon Lake watershed and our watersheds in general, um, the ecosystem services and the science-based goals of our watershed management plan. So hope you can join us on November 4th. You can find information on our website at plwa.ca. But, but um, turning back to today's session, Terry, thank you very much. Um, and I, I hope that if anyone has questions for Terry about beaver management, you could give her a call. Her information was posted online. We'll also be sending a follow-up email to participants with links to the resources she mentioned at today's session. Thank you all for attending. Yes, thank you very much.